is titled, Taking the Path of Least Resistance. And that's sort of what I did. Um, there's a, a, an artist story on uh, Chicago Artist Resource uh, that goes into a lot of detail about that. But my talk today, I figure it's uh, toward the end of the day, and I'm going to keep it fairly succinct. I had a very detailed, elaborate presentation, and I'm not going to use it at all. Uh, so I'm just going to kind of give you a quick background on how I got into leasing and renting artwork, and uh, really open it up for questions and let you direct me as to what you would like to know. Uh, my background, unlike a lot of the artists who spoke today, is not fine art. Uh, I'm a refugee from corporate America, uh, circa 2008. I left the management consulting industry, and before that, technology and private equity, um, sales. And uh, I've always loved and, and appreciated artwork. And I'm the least talented of the artists that I work with myself. Um, but I knew that the company I was working for was going to be closing its doors. And I'd been involved in some entrepreneurship previously. Um, and I thought maybe it was the right time to re-explore that. The market was terrible, and most people thought that I had absolutely gone stark raving mad for opening up an art business. But I drew on a lot of my corporate experience. Um, the, the business model that I learned when I was in sales was about recurring revenue. It was about a subscription. It was about an annuity. You know, I, I don't like to sell something over and over and over. I like to sell a service or benefit one time, support it well, and let it generate a sustainable income. Uh, because I think for most of us as artists, the single biggest challenge, you know, beyond advocacy, beyond having space, beyond anything else I can think of, is just having basic visibility over your income. When you're an artist, you're essentially a straight commission salesperson who doesn't have that training, and a lot of times that inclination. Um, so it's, it, it can be really challenging. You know, I, I sometimes ask artists, you know, if you know what, what your business is going to generate next month or next quarter. And very few can say yes, reliably. So I think that's something that, that you know, it's probably been this way for a very, very long time. Um, but there's been a lot of changes. And I think the market has never been more accessible through things like social media, through things like you know, Facebook, Twitter, um, you know, uh, LinkedIn. You know, an artist can really reach a tremendous audience. You know, uh, news, newsletters through really MailChimp and constant contact. These things are easy and affordable and accessible. But I still didn't see a lot of sustainable models. So initially, back in 2008, I started investigating and talking to um, real estate developers and hotel owners and managers uh, if there would be a value uh, in, in having temporary sort of rotated markets. And uh, I was surprised because they said yes. They said actually that would be great. Uh, I knew that there were benefits to the artists. Being able to have that residual income over time could scale. But the real question is, well, what about the market? Does the market want this service or this, this solution? And they said yes. And I think a lot of it had to do with taxes, with tax benefits. Uh, you know, my computer over there is depreciating every second and getting less valuable, less useful. There's newer ones rolling off the assembly line. But when it comes to fine art, the tax code says, wait, hold up. That piece of work is not going to be less valuable over time. It's going to be more valuable. So when companies purchase artwork, it becomes what's called a non-depreciable capital asset. Basically, it sits on their books the way the bacon cheeseburger I had two weeks ago is going to sit in my digestive system. For years, you can't do anything about it. Um, <coughs> but when it's leased, the company doesn't own it. So, it's, it's, an, uh, it's an expense rather than an asset. And as such, they can write that off. Uh, and they can rotate it every few months. So if you're, you know, let's say you're four attorneys who broke off from Dwayne Morris and miss having that, you know, Chagall hanging over your printer, well, I can, you know, through the leasing, it 
it's an easy and an affordable way to provide that look without the cost or without the commitment. Um, so it's worked to varying degrees. Um, it's, it, it goes through peaks and valleys. Uh, I've had a lot of success with uh, interior designers and specifically home stagers who always have temporary needs, which is kind of ideally matched to having temporary artwork. And really, as a market, I look at anybody who has a need for rented furniture, or, it, you know, that typically becomes a good market for leased artwork. Um, it's, uh, like I said, peaks and valleys, but I, I see other companies out there taking this idea and running with it, companies like Artsicle and, uh, you know, there's a few other big ones. Um, so, so I know it's feasible, uh, and it seems to be growing. But I always tell people it is not a silver bullet. As far as I'm aware, it's, it, it, you know, I don't know that it can be the only bullet in your arsenal as an artist. Um, it's something different, like installment purchase, like um, trade of service like other things that can generate real value, it's just another option for you as artists to have in your bag of tricks. And I think, you know, the more potential options you have, the more sustainable an art career you can create. Um, you know, some, some works lend themselves better to leasing, uh, and some don't. And, uh, you know, what I've learned, I think, it is a few things. One of the key lessons is about pricing. And whether you're doing sales or whether you're doing leasing, um, one of the questions that I think a lot of artists have is about price. How do you price? How do you, you know, make sure that you're setting the right price for your artwork? And my answer is that I stay away from that. Um, so my answer is a non-answer. Um, I'm working mostly with, with artists who who have a sense, I think, of what the market will bear for your work within a range. Uh, so I put the onus on the artist to provide me with their retail sales price. And that becomes my starting point. Uh, when I started this a few years back, I thought that I would be remarkably bad at figuring out the price of artwork. So I'd rather not do things that I'm likely to be very bad at. Uh, I think I've gotten a little better, and I've got a better sense. But I'm still more comfortable, you know, with, with the artist providing me what they're looking for. And then working backwards from that. And when, when you're exploring leasing as an option, you've got to keep the differential between the sales price and the lease price far enough that it's appealing. But you, if you go too low, well, you know, leasing a piece for $5 a month over the course of several centuries might be good. But, you know, you don't want to go so low as to not really be able to generate a benefit for yourself. Or so high that people look at it and say, well, if I'm paying $5,000 a month for a piece that's $6,000, you know, I'm going to do the math pretty quickly and say that doesn't really work out for me. Um, because most of my, my clients are corporate, I figure they're looking at their books uh, for a line item like interior design once a year. They're going to look at what they've spent, maybe quarterly, um, maybe biannually. But as long as my one-year lease cost is less than the cost of purchase by a, by a decent margin, um, what seems to be bearing out is that clients will choose to continue to do it from year to year. Um, we've got several clients, some very large and some very small, who have been with us two and three uh, and almost four years now. So that tells me that the pricing is probably right, you know, for the value uh, that they're getting, which is they don't have to commit to the piece, they don't have to manage the piece, and they can, you know, have the flexibility of changing it anytime they like. And most places do that once or twice a year, uh, has been my experience. Um, but that's, that's been a key learning. Um, another is the simple reality that when you're leasing work, you've got to get it back. You know, at some point, a lease is going to end. Uh, it may end in a sale, which is great, in which case you don't have to worry about being able to get the artwork back. Um, however, you know, if over the course of two or three years you're providing artwork and someone says, well, you know, this is, we're, we're not going to be renewing our contract, 
um, then all the installation and transport that went into getting it there has to happen a second time. This is also part of why I've chosen to focus more on corporate um, as opposed to individual. Uh, we have leased individuals before, um, and, and we still get some of that interest, but people move around all the time. I mean, we all probably know people who've had 16 different addresses in the past three years. You know, some from New Mexico to Zimbabwe. Um, companies tend to move less. If I have a floor in the Aon Center, I'm probably not going anywhere for a while. You know, my lease is two, four, ten years, whatever it is. Um, if it's an individual, just use your best judgment and make sure that this person isn't going to pick up and move to, uh, you, you know, the other end of the earth uh, with your offer, because that will make it relatively hard to get it back. Uh, I haven't had any trouble recovering works. Uh, we've moved, give or take, 140 or 150 pieces over the past few years. We had one get damaged. Um, so another consideration, make sure that you have a a thorough agreement. I think this is something we should be doing anyway, even if it's just a, a standard sale. Um, but make sure that you're protected, that you've thought through the eventualities. If something's damaged in transit, are you using an insured installer who can say, okay, yeah, you know, it's on my policy, it's fine. Or did you hire somebody to strap it to his bag and run down the street with it? Um, you know, sometimes expediency and and I think our fear that a contract is going to scare people away prohibits us from using one, but it should. Um, you know, that's just good business. It protects you. It protects them. Um, you know, so that's that's kind of that. Um, where I'm at now, four years in, uh, leasing is growing. Some of it's seasonal with the, the home staging business. Uh, I've just partnered with one of my vendors to open a physical space, so uh, you know we kind of, we, we kind of nicely mitigated each other's risk uh, in some ways, allowing to open uh, Blackbird Chicago Art Leasing Gallery, in, which is a long name, uh, and we may change once we think of something better. Uh, but for the time being, it's a collaboration between Chicago Art Leasing and Blackbird Gallery. Uh, we do some framing out of there, we do some events out of there, uh, and mostly it's a cost style gallery. Um, that's where I am presently. There are a few other lines of business uh, through which I have that feed into my business, um, including some consulting and some things that are not necessarily related to artwork. Um, and then looking ahead, looking down the road, you know, my hope and my plan is to replicate what I've done here in a handful of other secondary and tertiary cities uh, and make the move from Chicago Art Leasing to National Art Leasing. Um, because I believe it's scalable, it's replicable, it's everything I used to look for back in my private equity days. Yes? So if you did scale it up, would you still be doing this on the house staging as well on a national level? I think so. And I think part of the appeal is, is that it's local, you know? So how do you expand and still maintain that focus on local artwork? My solution was that I went out and grabbed every city I could think of, artleasing.com, New York, Philly, Austin, Boston, Dallas, National, Global, Dubai, Moscow, London, Tel Aviv, um, so that I can start, you know, breaking the artists down uh, so if someone goes to Miami Art Leasing, they're seeing Miami artists. Um, so I think I still do want to want to work locally in each of those markets, uh, and I think the, I think you can kind of have the best of both worlds. But that's a great question. Um, before I ramble further, um, you know, my hope is that that you can kind of guide me. What are your questions about renting, leasing the artwork, um, Mr. Larry? Dyke. Yes, I have a, um, just an observation and maybe a suggestion. I've come across it a couple of times, one through the gallery, one through the retail store, where these companies would allow a potential buyer to take a piece of art home and try it out. Mm -hmm. And if they decide they like it, it gets charged to their charge card and 
simplifies the whole thing quite a bit. And I'm wondering if you considered incorporating something like that into the retrieval of the art, so that if somebody does decide that they're too busy or want to uh, allow you to take the art back, they could turn it into a sale for the benefit and just be charged onto a charge card of some sort. Uh, absolutely. Uh, you know, that's, I've heard that also referred to as the puppy dog flows. And the reason it's called the puppy dog flows is that pet stores would see, you know, father and child playing with, you know, the cute little pug. And dad looks at his watch and he's got to get going. And the kids still can't let go. And the, uh, the pet store owner seeing this will say, well, look, why don't you take them home for a night? Just, you know, you don't want to break little Timmy's heart. Take the dog home with you, and once that dog goes out the door with those folks, it's sold. I, I don't know that the dog has ever come back, <laughs> you know, to the store. Uh, because w once they've lived with it, it's part of their family. Once you have the piece, you know, filling that gaping hole in your, your bedroom wall or your office, it's easier to keep it than to lose it. Um, so that's definitely something that I've been considering. Um, I've started doing some, um, some, some mailers, you know, those neighborhood directs. The first ones go out on November 2nd, and the offering that I'm using is one free month of leasing with any three months. So if somebody chooses to lease artwork for three months, the first one is on us. Um, it gives a minimum you know, those three months, so we know that we've generated the revenue sufficient to cover. Uh, and given our, our history, the likelihood is that they will continue to do so or to change. So that's very much aligned with my thinking and an excellent observation. Yeah, what, what else? What else can I tell you? Yes? In terms of the you know, shipping and That's, that's a, gr a great observation because it can get pretty complex, and especially as you scale and start working with different locations. Um, I offer two options. Um, typically, I like to work with third-party installers. Um, I like because you know they know what they're doing. They're efficient. There's some great ones I've worked with. Um, you know, recently uh, Pete Solaire.